And today I'm going to talk about USP, otherwise known as the User Service Platform, otherwise known as TR369. Um, so I'm going to give you a sense of what USP is, why it exists, um, and then I'm going to go into a little bit of what we have architecture-wise, and then some of the test cases, how you configure a CD router to get USP working. So what is USP? Well, it's it's really just TR69 for IoT sort of devices. People have said it's the next iteration of TR69. And so, you know, instead of in TR69 you have an ACS, now you have a controller. And instead of a TR69 client, you now have an agent. Um, so, you know, you might just say, well, why not use TR69? And, you know, in this new IoT world, the heaviness of a protocol is really important. If you have, you know, 15 smart things in your house, you're going to have a really noisy network. And so that's the thing. TR69 is heavy. There's a lot of overhead to start a session. Um, and every message contains, you know, a lot of headers and SOAP information that really isn't needed. So there's that. Plus, in the TR69 world, you really only have one ACS. So one thing controlling a bunch of you know, agents, um, whereas in USP, that is not necessarily the case. So now, you know, the other side of things, so why USP? And the really, you know, one of the main things is it's lightweight. Um, there's no, like, you know, big connection requests and things like that. All the messages that are exchanged are very specific to what is happening. Um, you know, the, the connection request thing is a, a very big part of TR69 where you send a connection request and they reply back. And then there's this handshake back and forth and then eventually you get a session where you actually do what you want to do. But in USP, there's just, hey, give me that value. Um, and so another thing is they wanted support for multiple protocols. So in the TR69 world, everything runs over HTTP. Um, and that really might not be the best choice for for some things. And like I said before, this idea of multiple controllers, uh, you know, you can easily imagine like a couple people in your house wanting to be able to control your smart light bulb um, and not just have one central hub where you have to go hit a switch. That's sort of the whole idea behind smart things, right? So what are the technologies of USP? Um, this is just a very vague overview, but down here is the MTP or the message transport protocol. Uh, and then inside of that is this thing called protobuf. And inside of that is where the real USP message is. So what really is MTP? Um, so it's the thing, you know, in, in the TR69 world, it's the equivalent of like HTTP. So, you know, how are you actually exchanging things back and forth? And so, like I said, with TR69, you can do HTTP. There's HTTPS, um, which is recommended. And then also they've added this whole XMPP connection request mechanism. Um, so that's pretty much the flavors you get with TR69. But in USP, they tried to use some more relevant or recent technologies, I guess you'd say. Um, and those include WebSockets, CoAP, and Stomp, which I can't imagine many of you have heard of, um, except for maybe from the last presentation. Uh, <laughs> so WebSockets is a lot like HTTP. Um, it actually is kind of the same deal. You, know, you start off with a normal exchange of uh, HTTP headers, and then you say, hey, let's upgrade this to a WebSocket connection. And so it becomes this continuous stream of data back and forth. Um, and then there's you know, the occasional keep alives and things. And so one really nice thing about that is you can have just a persistent connection to a device instead of you know, this whole connection request thing, like you know, I got to go poke the device to come talk to me so that I can talk to it. You, know, you just always have a channel of communication open. Um, and that works quite nicely, you know, especially over gateways and things like that where you have to worry about firewalls you know, getting in the way. These keep alives will make sure you know, your firewall doesn't slap things down and, and stuff like that. CoAP is a bit like HTTP, um, except it uses UDP instead of TCP. It has a really small footprint. I think one of the, the main ideas for creating CoAP was to you know, like 
understanding did a lot of IoT things. So they wanted to make a really lightweight, um, pretty simple protocol. And actually, you know, to add to the lightweightness, all the headers are compressed in this scheme so that you know you don't have to really spell everything out, uh, which is pretty nice. And there's also this idea of confirmable and unconfirmable connections. So you can just send out a message and not care if it comes back, which is what we're used to in the UDP world. But also, you can get you know confirmable messages saying, "Did you actually get this?" And you know, after some time out, you know that you did or didn't. Um, and then there's Stomp, which is the last one. And Stomp is quite a bit like XMPP, uh, which is I don't know if any of you know the you know way instant messaging works. And so the way Stomp works is there is a central Stomp server. And then everyone is a Stomp client that just connects to the server, and you can subscribe to certain channels. And so in the context of USP, a, both a controller and an agent would just be Stomp clients that connect to some server they share and say, hey, can you send my agent this message? And the Stomp server will say, oh, yeah, sure, and forward it to the agent. So moving up a layer, there's, now we're talking about protobuf. And so protobuf is a thing that was written by Google or you know, invented by Google somewhat recently. Um, they wanted to just be able to transport data as effectively as possible. And so it looks quite a bit like JSON, um, except that whereas you know, in JSON, every value has a key that goes with it, in protobuf, both sides kind of know this schema beforehand. And so there is no need to include the keys in what you actually send. You just say, like, I'm going to send, this is key number 17. Um, and so in that way, you actually save a lot of space. Uh, but the downside is you can't really read it on the wire. So you know, in Wireshark and things like that, you would need a protobuf file to you know, go with it to understand what, what you're actually looking at. Um, and then the last point is, Within USP, there's actually two layers of protobuf used. Um, there's this outer layer, which is called the USP record. And that contains things like, who's this message to? Who's it from? You know, that kind of stuff. And then inside of that, there's a payload, which is another USP or a protobuf encoded chunk of data that is actually the message that it gets sent back and forth. So this is sort of an example of, uh, this is straight off the USP GitHub. Um, these are the dot proto files for the stuff that's exchanged. This is that record I was just talking about that has things like to and from. Um, and then this is rate, I can't see it. But in here someplace, there's a place for payload. And then that's where this whole thing would fit. And so you know, this is just a regular message with a header and body and, and things like that. Um, so I guess now let's talk about the real USP part. So USP is very similar to TR69, where they offer a lot of the same sort of messages that can be exchanged. You, know, you have your adds, deletes, your sets and gets. Um, they also support get instances, uh, which is a bit like uh, get names or um, get parameter names. And then there's also get supported data model. So if you just want to know what a device supports, whether it has instances of something or not, um, you can use that. And then get supported protocol is uh, you know what version of USP you're using. And then notify and operate um, are for like event sort of things. Um, Yeah, so another key difference between TR69 and USP is in USP, everything is a part of the data model. So in TR69, you can set up notifications, and that's sort of this backgrounded process. Um, but in USP, you actually create a subscription, which is an object in the data model. And, and then there's functions in the data model that you can call through these operate messages. And you know, when, when something happens on an agent, it will send you a notify message. Uh, so it's 
just definitely a, a big difference there that, that everything that you can do with an agent is really part of the data model. And so this is just an example of sort of the differences in the amount of communication to get a pretty simple amount of information from a TR-69 client versus a USP agent. So, you know, here on this side, clearly there's a lot of back and forth um, over on the USP side. Not nearly as much at all. It's just, give me this value, here it is. Um, so another neat thing about USP is this notion of sessions, which are part of USP records. Um, they're an optional part, in fact. And so sessions can store, it, it's essentially like a, uh, a ripoff of TCP where you can have a sequence number and, and then in that way create uh, some sense of, you know, like, oh yeah, these are actually being delivered and nothing's out of order and stuff like that. Another thing that sessions give you is the ability to encrypt the payload part of the USP message. Um, and they allow you to segment things at the USP layer. So, you know, if, if you don't want to segment, you know, way down the OSI stack towards the bottom, instead you want to keep it at the application layer, this is the right choice for you. Um, and of course, sessions, like I said, as with everything else, are, you know, part of the data model. So that is the path right there. And for security, quite a bit, um, you can have security at the MTP layer. So like I said, WebSockets is based off of HTTP, so you can just use HTTPS and have a secure WebSocket connection. CoApp, there's a secure counterpart called CoApps that uses DTLS, which is just TLS for UDP. And then Stomp can also be secured with TLS. Um, Additionally, if that wasn't enough, you can also secure the USP layer. Um, so as I mentioned before, in the sessions part, you'd have a, a USP record that's in plain text, but then inside of that is your payload, and that can be encrypted with TLS, which, uh, you know, for the most part, you might think, well, what's the use of that? But in the case where you might be bridging between two MTPs or something like that, and you want to make sure that whoever is bridging from Stomp to WebSockets, you know, can still read, okay, who do I actually send this message to, but can't read the underlying payload, like the messages you're actually sending, then that is the use case. Um, okay. Yes? How, did, how does the, um, the agent know that it's talking to the correct controller? Or how does the control, if, how does it know that it's not some malicious controller trying to do that? Yeah, so there's, uh, well, there's certificates. It still uses. It uses certificates, yeah. And then additionally, within the, you know, on a more simple level, everyone has their own unique ID. Um, so you can say, you know, send this message to my controller at, you know, and, uh, and so that will give you some semblance with that in combination with the certificate that, you know, this is legit. Mm -hmm. So then the last part I want to talk about with USP uh, is some of the bonus features. So with TR69, you can just use partial paths in gets and, uh, and like get parameter names. And that will give you all the data model underneath that path which is fine, but now USP has offered you know, some, some bonus features where, like in this case, you can say, hey, get me all the SSIDs, all the SSID instances where the SSID is home network. Um, and unfortunately, <laughs> now you can actually do this with tier 69 too, but it supports wildcards. Uh, so you can just say, give me all the statuses of all your SSIDs. And so this is sort of a fuller stack example with co-apps using uh, a secure session at the USP layer. 
So you know, down here, underneath co-apps is UDP, as we talked about. And then there's this DTLS secure layer, which then wraps the co-app message, which contains the USP record, which is encoded with protobuf. And inside of that is a payload, which is TLS encrypted, which contains a USP payload that is encoded with protobuf. So there's quite a few layers. Um, but I just wanted to make it clear that, you know, that is the case. There's, there's quite a few layers here, and, you know, a lot of it is very interchangeable, where this co-app part could be um, Stomp or WebSockets. So now I'm going to move on to sort of what we have in terms of our capabilities with CD Router. So we have a controller written that supports all three MTPs and all of the uh, operations you'd want to do. And it also supports callbacks for you know, when a new agent connects or getting a message from a specific agent or a specific message type and a specific agent or just a specific message type. So that'll give you a lot of flexibility with, you know, if, if you have a test case that you have you know, five agents or something like that out there and being able to really control how each one interacts with the controller. And then in terms of test modules, so we have this USP.tickle, which is sort of a rebranded version of the PlugFest test cases. Um, we have USP Basic, which is just four really simple test cases just to make sure that things are working. Um, the idea really is, like, does this MTP and you know, encryption combination work? And so it really doesn't any, do anything uh, too complicated, like just gets and really simple sets. And additionally, two of these test cases will be included in the demo. And then for USP conformance, these are the uh, up and coming BBF conformance tests for USP. And those are all implemented up to date with, with what exists. Um, and then there's also the USP data models test, which is very similar to the custom profiles test in TR69. There's also USP scenarios, which is just like the TR69 scenarios. And then all of the profile tests that you know, you're probably familiar with from the TR69 side, um, you know, device two, FAP service two, SDB service one, storage service one, and voice service two. So one thing I wanted to touch on is this idea of USP scenarios. And so they're not exactly the same. Um, you couldn't just run a, a CWMP scenario this way. Um, but it's very similar. You know, I don't really think there would be a learning curve at all. Um, and see, there's also support for bootstrap scenarios, just like in CWMP. And so one, you know, Extra interesting thing is we've now added support for this wait for events. So you can do something like add a subscription and then set a parameter and then wait for a value change. And then, you know, once you get it, you're happy and uh, then you can delete the subscription. And additionally, we've added this idea of inline support for scenarios. So inside a test case, if you're trying to do something not too complicated, but you know, you just feel like it would be annoying to, to write out. You can just have a scenario in line with a test case, uh, which sort of just makes simple actions a lot simpler. 